Let's be clear, Xena the show is gay. Very gay. It's basically gay from start to end and it only gets gayer as the seasons go on. But there are some standout moments that I think deserve being called out. From the lighthearted moments to the dramatic and sexy, here is my list of Xena and Gabrielle's gayest moments. I'd love to hear what your personal top picks are in the comments. Is Xena all you think about? She Xena is my family. She's the most important thing in my life. Xena and I have a connection. It's stronger than either one of us. We're soulmates. We didn't, we didn't make it that way, it just is. I can see your heart lies with Xena, but I'll prove to you which one of us deserves your love. Let's start strong with the gay trilogy of the Rheingold, which is all about true love and the fact that Xena and Gabrielle are soulmates. When Xena runs off to the land of Norse to make right or wrong from long ago, fully expecting to die, Gabrielle naturally follows her. And on that journey, she meets a young Valkyrie, Brunhilde, who falls in love with her. In an attempt to protect Gabrielle from Odin, the Norse god, and to prove her love, Brunhilde turns herself into an eternal flame, which puts Gabrielle into a deep sleep. A sleeping beauty sleep, if you will. Meanwhile, Xena, working to undo her past mistakes, loses what she holds most dear, which is her memory of Gabrielle and the woman that Gabrielle helped her become. A year later, still without her memory, she is discovered by Beowulf, a friend, and he takes her back to the eternal flame in Gabrielle because, as her soulmate, she is the only one who can cross the flame. She does that. And how does one awaken their soulmate? Why? With a kiss, of course. But this is by no means the only kiss that we get in the show. There is also the marriage kiss, where Gabrielle weds Perdiccas for plot reasons, and Xena kisses her gal pal as a wedding gift, as you do. And then looks like she's positively destroyed by Gabrielle leaving her. Zena, I can't lose you again. Gabrielle will always be here. There is also the infamous quest kiss, where Xena dies, possesses Autolycus's body, and then decides that the best way to show Gabrielle that her soul is still with her is to go in for a kiss, much to Autolycus's surprise and mine. My baby gay brain exploded. And finally, the kiss of life in the finale of Friend in Need Part 2, where Xena is almost dead on Mount Fuji. Gabrielle reaches the Fountain of Life, and having no other way to get the water from there to Xena, holds the water in her mouth. And obviously, that requires tender lip-to-lip -lip contact to then pass the water from her mouth to Xena's. Speaking of A Friend in Need, while it was an atrocious ending to the series, it also gave us one of the shippiest declarations of the show. If I only had 30 seconds to live, this is how I'd want to live them. Looking into your eyes. There is so little room for this to be interpreted as platonic that you'd need to do a hundred point turn in order to maneuver yourself out of this one. And why would you? I wish I'd known you were looking for a father. I'm not. Oh? Well, somebody clearly got the job. Yeah, Gabriel. I would have paid to see that. When Xena gets pregnant, it's not clear how or who the father is. But on a show like Xena, the answer is not the obvious. It's the miraculous. Because she is pregnant by immaculate conception with the daughter who has the soul of her greatest enemy, Callisto, because Xena and Gabrielle were crucified and went to heaven, but also to hell, where Xena redeemed Callisto's soul because the reason Callisto was evil was because Xena destroyed her village and killed her family and friends back when she was a warlord. But that's all beside the point. Because what matters is who's going to co-parent that child, and well, obviously, it's Gabrielle and she looks rather smug about it. You and I have much in common. Of course we do. You're a mortal female with a lying tongue, savage tendencies, and a blonde girlfriend. If you want to seduce the fallen angel Lucifer to the dark side so he can take the throne in hell as the devil, then what better way to do that than to have a sexy dance with your girlfriend while dressed in skin-tight leather? I mean, that's what I would do if I wanted to save the world from unutterable darkness. When Gabrielle ends up on the menu of the friendly local cannibals and ends up in a raging river, Xena jumps in to save her and, as hypothermia begins to take over and Gabrielle thinks she might just die, she has a very specific request. I don't want to be buried with the Amazons. I want to lie with you, with your family. What about your family? I love them. But I'm a part of you. I want it to be like that forever.
because, of course, why wouldn't you want to be buried next to your soulmate? Do you really believe that kind of love exists? It's what we all dream about, isn't it? Someone would look so deeply into our soul that they'd find something we're dying for. I couldn't actually pick a gayest moment from this episode because the whole thing is so gay in an already gay show. Is it the moment their eyes meet and Gabrielle has a moment? Is it when Xena shrinks into the shadows of her own balcony because seeing Gabrielle overwhelms her senses? Is it how Caesar already knows that he's lost Xena and jealously tries to get rid of Gabrielle? Or perhaps it's Gabrielle declaring, My life is empty, despite my success. I write about love, but I've never felt it before. Or is it this moment? When I'm with you, this emptiness that I have felt my entire life is gone. Some things are worth dying for. Isn't that what your play was about? Being prepared to sacrifice all for love. For love. I'll love you forever. Don't touch her. Or maybe it's Gabrielle going to the fate's tapestry of time and destroying it because a world without Xena was not a world worth living. I mean, you choose. It's an embarrassment of riches. I couldn't finish out this list without mentioning the poem. With the sun setting over the ocean, with the satisfaction of an adventure done, Xena gives Gabrielle a poem written by Sappho of Lesbos to express how she feels because who better to put into words the love she has for her warrior bard. There's a moment when I look at you and no speech is left in me. My tongue breaks, then fire races under my skin and I tremble and grow pale for I am dying of such love or so it seems to me. <laughs> I almost got you that time. No, you didn't. What are you talking about? I was this close. You were this close because I let you get this close. Much like when fates collide, which made it onto part one, this is one where it's hard to pick a single moment. This episode is rightly beloved by the Woman Love Woman community. It's dripping with the kind of subtext that got the queer ladies talking in the first place. It's domestic fluff with a great wallop of gay subtext, starting with... <laughs> our only frying pan. Why do you do that? You do have weapons, don't you? I like to be creative in a fight. I guess my juice is going. Can we cook with your juices? Then there's this rather telling moment. Does Zena ever think about settling down and getting married? No. She likes what I do. <laughs> and of course, the bathtub scene. Are you sitting on the soap? I was wondering what that was. It's also peppered with the bickering married vibes, Gabrielle's hand on Xena's breastplate, and, at the end of a hard day, them lying on a blanket together and stargazing. Yep, married vibes, for sure. Although, I do have a theory on when they get together, and I may just make a vid on that in the future, so, I don't know, stay tuned. Then there is fan favourite Minya, who seems to be crushing on Xena. You, you're Xena, aren't you? Yes. You are the main thing, the real deal, you know, the number one attraction. And total spoiler. Thank you. I never would have met Paulina if it wasn't for you. In fact, the two of you made me realize something deep down about myself that I guess I always knew but just didn't dare admit. I'm a thespian. Mm-hmm. I was happy when I was a kid here because I was loved and I felt like I belonged. I was lucky then and I'm lucky now. Another episode that leans into the domestic fluff vibe was the old Aries Had a Farm episode, which gives us a glimpse into what it might have looked like if Xena and Gabrielle had settled down somewhere. While for sure it was a thruple situation with Aries in the picture, I think even he knew he stood no chance with Xena, especially with this moment when Gabrielle helps Xena into her armour. Suck it in. It just screams married wives because you know that Gabs has helped her woman get dressed a lot. And undressed, too, naturally. I'm just saying she has an intimate knowledge of Xena's clothes. Also, look at how they're looking at each other here. 
This karma that you're talking about, can you see mine? Can you see how much Zena is a part of that? Yes. In many lives, past and future. Zena is the only person for Gabrielle, as we find out later in the show. When they are both looking for their paths in life in season 4, they head to India on a spiritual quest. What they find is that the shamaness Alti is trying to mess with one of their future lives, so they're off to defeat her. What emerges from this encounter is that Gabrielle and Zena are destined to be together again and again, karmically linked. Is that gay? Or is it gay? Maybe they're not always in female bodies in each incarnation, but they are the literal incarnation of this story that Gabrielle spoke of in season one. Once a long, long time ago, all people had four legs and two heads. And then the gods threw down thunderbolts and split everyone into two. Each half then had two legs and one head. But the separation left both sides with a desperate yearning to be reunited. Because they each shared the same soul. And ever since then, all people spend their lives searching for the other half of their soul. Maybe she just needs air. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, wake up and breathe. You never ran from anything in your whole life. Don't you leave me! Don't leave me! Don't leave me! Wake up! sure was a pivotal moment in the Zena and Gabrielle relationship. With this episode, we get to see just how much Gabrielle has come to mean to Zena. I don't think even Zena realised how deeply she felt for her until this moment. It marked something of a transition for the character of Gabrielle. In that first season, she was framed as young and sometimes referenced as being that annoying blonde following Zena around. She was often the comic relief, but here she became someone with far more weight. She became someone Zena couldn't do without. Leading up to that moment at the end of season one, Gabrielle had been giving off some baby gay vibes for sure. I won't stay home. I don't belong there, Zena. I'm not the little girl that my parents wanted me to be. That alone is a sentiment that the queer community often connects with, as well as the desire to leave behind the restrictive communities we've grown up in that often don't accept us. Gabrielle then becomes positively starstruck at the, I assume, first non-conventional woman to come along because she's different. When you add it to moments like, <laughs> It's not like your breasts aren't dangerous enough. And, By the gods. What is it? You are beautiful. It sure feels like a wee queer narrative is expressing itself here. Also, I'm very curious to understand what this moment means. Because, like, it's suggestive especially when combined with the activity of catching fish, which, you know, a uh, euphemism. Come on, Gabrielle, let's get wet! Speaking of fish, in the episode Fin, Fems and Gems, there are a few fishy references. You know the writers were having so much fun with the fish references. You stick your hand under the water and you feel around until you find a great big succulent fish, and then you do this, you wiggle your fingers. Why would I want to do that? Because it's fun! Right. Well, don't knock it till you've tried it. A fist of fish? I can barely say it, much less do it. <laughs> but that is not the gay moment that stands out for me in this episode. Rather, it's this. I looked into your eyes and seen it, I finally realized there can only be one person for me in my life. Me. <laughs> Even through Zena's obsessive fishing-induced haze, she still loves Gabrielle so much that this declaration has her looking positively crestfallen that Gabrielle doesn't say that Zena is the only person for her. Because Zena really is the only one for Gabrielle. After much spiritual seeking, after trying the way of peace that saw her put down her weapon and dedicate herself to pacifism, she is forced to choose between that and her relationship with Zena. The decision is instantaneous. The way of peace is nothing if she is not by Zena's side. I made you leave the way of love. I had a choice. To do nothing or save my friend, I chose the way of friendship. A long time ago, I accepted the consequences of our life together. 
that it might one day come to this. You always said that I was the brave one. Look at you now. This is to be our destiny. Let's see it out together. Even in death, Gabrielle. I will never leave you. This fan favorite episode offered a rare opportunity for us to see Xena and Gabrielle in this quiet, character-driven two-hander episode. Gabrielle is wounded with a poison arrow, but with the Persian army advancing on Athens and with Xena the only thing standing in the way, we see her struggle with putting the needs of the many before the need to find an antidote to save Gabrielle. The first thing is the greater good. You taught me that. You taught me that there are things in life worth dying for. Things that hold a higher meaning than our own existence. Not your existence. Why? Because I'm your friend? Yes. It offers a number of poignant moments between our gals, which reinforces the strength of their bond. But you're my source, Gabrielle. When I reach down inside myself and do things that I'm not capable of, it's because of you. Don't you know that by now? None is, in my opinion, more poignant, however, than this quiet moment when, awoken from a bad dream, Gabrielle lays back and touches Zena's hair with such reverence. The theme of the greater good crops up throughout the show. While in one against an army, Xena, with Gabrielle's insistence, reluctantly chooses the greater good. When Gabrielle is to be killed for the manslaughter of an innocent, she doesn't. Because, well, they've long established that their souls are entwined back in season four. By season six, it's abundantly clear to her that Gabrielle is essential in her life and that she will do anything to keep Gabrielle safe. Consequences be damned. You saved me today, Xena, against the greater good. Gabrielle, in everyone's life, there's something that goes beyond the greater good. That's what you are in my life. Nowhere is this more painfully obvious when, in the season 3 finale, Gabrielle falls into a lava pit with her evil demigod daughter Hope to save Xena from being killed. The Xena we see in Gabrielle's absence is lost. I'm entering a world of darkness I promised myself I'd never return to. But it's the only way I can see you again. My mind has lost its center. Her grief is all-encompassing. It's the grief of a woman who has lost her soulmate, and so the only thing she can do to keep herself tethered to reality, to keep herself going, is to search for Gabrielle's soul. She tracks down Hades and then ventures into the Amazon afterlife to find her. She does it by using shamanism she learned from Alti, a magic that pulls her into a kind of madness, and it's only at the last minute when she's confronted with a past wrong she must set right does she seem to be able to regain her sense of self. You know, nothing would make me happier than seeing you again. You were my light. I just realized what it was that you gave me. A light of my own. There's something I gotta do. I love you. What strikes me most about this sequence is just how jarring the magic she uses to find Gabriella's is and how it serves as a way to communicate the intense and deep grief she has. I viscerally felt the trauma of this loss, which in turn speaks to the depth of her love for Gabrielle. Her ability to recognize this light that Gabrielle helped her find says a lot about where Xena started out on the show, burying her armor because she's ready to give up on life and where she ends up able to see her own worth. When she says, I want you to know that I still think you are the best thing that ever happened to me. You gave my life meaning and joy. You will be a part of me forever. Those are not empty words. It's words like these that a typically laconic, stoic Xena expresses many times throughout the series. She was someone who had learned to be wary of any emotional vulnerability, but with Gabrielle, she quickly let her pass her defences, and not just that, but she expressed how important Gabrielle was to her again and again throughout the run. All I want is to be with you right now. You're my best friend. My family. I love you, Gabrielle. You talk about trying to find your way, but to me, you are my way. Now, in spite of how unshakable their relationship might seem, things weren't always good between the warrior princess and the battling bard. Season 3 saw some seismic events that pretty much obliterated Xena and Gabrielle's relationship. Starting with when Gabrielle was raped by the satanic god Dayhawk and consequently gave birth to her demon daughter Hope, you know, the one that she fell into the lava pit with. 
Unable to kill her own child, she sent her down the river and the daughter shows up again as a 10-year-old child and then kills Xena's son Solon. To add to it, Xena also has essentially abandoned Gabrielle to go repay a debt to Lao Ma, a mentor and, okay, let's be real, also a lover, by killing the green dragon. Gabrielle was so jealous she made a deal with the god of war Ares to get there ahead of Xena to stop her, which, let's just say, got super messy. Only the other could stir such powerful feelings of betrayal, hurt, and anger. By the time Xena and Gabrielle find themselves in the land of Illusia, they've got a lot of issues to deal with. They then work through everything, finally, coming to a place of forgiveness that allows them to reunite because even when the worst has happened, their love for each other transcends. And by transcends, I mean it literally transcends all of time and space, which is what we get to see in two episodes where the souls of Xena, Gabrielle and Joxa reincarnate in modern times as Harry, Matty and Annie. Annie, avid watcher of the hit show Xena Warrior Princess, gotta love the postmodernism of the 90s and the show's total willingness to derisively be self-referential, is convinced she is the reincarnation of said Warrior Princess because she keeps having visions. When she, along with her boyfriend Harry, go to to Matty, a past life regression therapist, the three of them realize that they are in fact the reincarnated souls of our three protagonists, only Xena is in Harry's body and not Annie's. At the end, Harry ditches Annie for Matty because they are soulmates after all. It's been a long time. It's been too long. I'd also like to make an aside here and say it's canon that using the word friend actually means lover when used by Xena and Gabrielle. Now, while you may be wondering how is this gay given they basically give us some convoluted straight shenanigans, we catch up with them in sole possession two seasons later and Harry aka Xena and Matty aka Gabrielle are now married. By the end of the episode, however, Xena is returned into her rightful body, that is to say Annie's, and well, Matty slash Gabrielle seems to have absolutely no problem switching from having a husband to having a wife. So while it may have superficially appeared to be straight to appease the powers that be and any Gabrielle joxa shippers, if there are any, it was in the end very not straight, which I think is an apt parable for the entire show. In its final season, the show really did throw all caution to the wind and gave us the gayest season of them all. What is also very not straight is the episode Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. From the title of the episode to the vampires, this episode was very gay, starting with Gabrielle dancing with two queer vampy looking ladies who then bite her. She in turn bites Xena. Gabrielle, do it. And uh, not to be a lesbian, but um... Zena looks like she's feeling things if her moans are... There you go. Because Xena was such an eclectic show, ranging in tone from slapstick to heart-wrenching drama and delighted in being self-aware, we got what is perhaps one of the most tongue-in-cheek episodes with season six when the actor Michael Hurst, who played Iolus on the sister show Hercules, came back as a snotty investigative journalist intent on exposing the most important question of all time. Are you two? Lovers. You want the truth? That's right, Zena. We want the truth. The whole world wants the truth. He also was trying to figure out why Xena wanted to steal the golden apples from the Norse god. It was to restore Aphrodite back to godhood because without her, no one could love anyone. Of course, when she is restored, Xena and Gabrielle look at each other with literal hearts falling from the sky. So even though the camera goes dead, just as we're about to find out. It's like this. Technically. I think we can guess the answer to this one. So let's just safely assume that Xena and Gabrielle were lovers, so finding out in one of the last episodes of the series that Xena and Ares were officially married back in season 4 in an agreement that spanned for eternity might sound shocking, probably ridiculous. You be my wife. How's this for an answer? And then have you wondering how on earth does that deserve to be on a list like this? But it is actually very gay of Xena. You see, this all happened after Xena lost her mind because Gabrielle had fallen into the lava pit in an effort to save Xena from being killed by the fates if she killed Hope, Gabrielle's evil demigod daughter. Anywho, in exchange, Ares offers to find Gabrielle and Xena, being desperate, agrees as long as it's in front of the lava pit. Kind of morbid, don't you think? No, I think it's fitting. I should be as close as possible to the one person in the world I meant to spend the rest of my life with. As I give myself over to the one person in the world, I would never choose. 
things escalate and it turns out that Gabrielle had given her soul to Ares in exchange for saving her daughter Hope's life. So Xena then trades her soul for Gabrielle's by signing the marriage scroll, which she then steals from Ares and hides under the ocean so that he can never claim her. That is, until the scroll is discovered, Ares comes to claim his bride, but Xena manages to outfox him and she gets to walk off into the sunset with her wife. So yes, she married Ares, but for the gayest reason to ever gay. Clearly, Xena has done some pretty crazy things in the name of saving Gabrielle from marrying Ares, being willing to go blind, to jumping onto the doomed ship of Cecrops. But getting beat into a pulp in order to save Gabrielle, the horror of it, is probably on the more extreme end. After being frozen for 25 years, Gabrielle returns to visit her family only to find Lilla, her sister, now a middle-aged woman, alone. Both parents and her husband dead after trying to rescue Sarah, Lilla's daughter, who was sold into Gurkhan's harem. Intent on revenge, Gabrielle infiltrates the harem along with Xena, and Gabs is about to pull a knife out to kill Gurkhan when Xena, aware of how ill-advised it was, tackles her to the ground and grabs the weapon. This earns her a prolonged amount of time of being bit up in a cell in one of the most graphic scenes, I would say, of the entire show. But Xena being willing to take a beating like that for Gabrielle's sake is not what makes this so gay. It's what keeps her going during that time. That's right, it's a vision of Gabrielle dancing sensually before her that does it. There is no straight explanation for this. I'm also struggling to find a straight explanation for the following moment. Xena's daughter Eve had recently been born and Gabrielle finds herself leading a small inexperienced Amazon tribe that needs her skills. She would love nothing more it seems than to settle down with Xena and raise Eve within the tribe which Xena doesn't seem to care too much for. In fact there seems to be a bit of trouble in paradise. Green Gabrielle. Not tonight. Who could she be saying that to hmm? Then this whole scene. While we're talking about relations with men, the looks and glances suggest something quite different. Why Gabrielle almost chokes when Xena looks at her as she says this about being chased forever. Forever is a long time. Is a sapphic mystery. And then I'm not sure why Xena is reacting like it's a big deal that Gabs likes things gentle and kind. That is, unless they're a couple and they have some things they probably need to talk about. In previous parts of the series, we've already explored how Xena is expressive about how much Gabrielle means to her, and we've seen how her grief manifests when Gabrielle dies. That is to say, she goes a bit doolally. But we haven't looked at what it looks like for Gabrielle. In season one, when Xena is struck by a poison dart and eventually succumbs, the way Gabrielle goes so deeply quiet as she looks at Xena's unmoving body and then goes to the forest to beat out her anguish shows how devastating a loss it is to her. We see it again in the two-parter Destiny and the Quest in season two when Xena dies from internal bleeding. When she comes across Iolus and he asks her what she would tell Xena if she could, she says, I would have told her how empty my life was before she came. That I love her. This is the first time we touch on this theme of emptiness in Gabrielle, but it is by no means the last. Zena, I know you can hear me. But you feel this emptiness that I've never known before, and it scares me. When I'm with you, this emptiness that I have felt my entire life is gone. And I think there may be another time somewhere I can't remember, but I can't think of a more potent way to communicate how vital Xena is to Gabrielle and how much of a hole is left in her heart without her. Which only makes sense, they are soulmates for all eternity. We see the breadth of what that means in Fallen Angel. After dying on the cross in the Eids of March, we see the souls of Gabrielle and Xena arrive in heaven. As the angels are lifting them to heaven, Gabrielle is grabbed by a creature from hell and is halfway to becoming a demon. Xena won't have it. She maneuvers into becoming an archangel to go rescue her but ultimately ends up becoming a fully fledged demon herself when she saves Callisto's soul. Even in her demonic state there is one thing she is very clear about however. Gabrielle the love that we have it's, it's stronger than heaven or hell. It transcends good or evil. It's an end in itself. Our souls are destined to be together. And, well, if that doesn't encapsulate what Xena and Gabrielle are to each other, then I don't know what does, and I think it makes a fitting conclusion to this four-part series. I feel like I hit on the major Xena and Gabrielle moments, but let me know which ones you think I should have included. If you've got any topics you'd like me to cover about the show Xena, feel free to pop that in the comments too. Until next time, lady lovers.